Right, I think we'll kick off um, this um, uh, webinar. So afternoon to everybody that is joining us for our Ask an Expert um, a webinar, which is all around how to I raise investment using social investment tax free. Um, very importantly, covering the pros and the cons. So um, I thought I'd give a little bit of background um, to why we're here. Um, Big Society Capital has been working um, with DCMS and with um, a range of partners on a campaign called um, Get SITR. Um, we're running that campaign because um, DCMS did some research last um, summer, which basically covered that one of the biggest barriers um, to um, people using SITR that was not enough people knew about it. So um, Get SITR is um, designed to try and uh, raise awareness of what social investment tax relief is and how it can be used. Um, you always get those sort of most frequently asked questions. Um, number one that I always get asked is, so what is it then? Um, and I'm hoping that uh, with a new resource, uh, a recently filmed uh, video where we've managed to use bread um, to be able to demonstrate what um, social investment tax relief is, that we might hopefully uh, be helping to crack that one. The second one is, okay, so when now I know what it is, am I eligible? So um, we can deal with that and have done with the previous webinars and a number of other resources around who's eligible. And we're not going to go into that level of technical detail today. And certainly the third question that I get um, is, okay, so I've decided that I want to raise some money. I want to consider using social investment tax relief. How do I go about finding some investors? Um, and um, I'm going to give credit actually to Grace for this um, uh, webinar because um, in part of our conversations about the content for um, the Get SITR campaign, we realised that we probably didn't have that much content on um, actually how to go about raising investment. So um, the purpose of today's um, webinar is to present the three options. Um, I'm sure we'll probably get into some questions later about um, actually are they three options and are they just different ways so let's just talk three different ways or potential ways of raising money so that of raising money using um, a fund manager um, raising money using um, crowdfunding or community shares um, and then raising money um, directly and doing it yourself um, and we've invited along our range of um, experts to um, chat to you the idea is going to give you about a 10 minute presentation um, covering both what they do but also the pros and the cons because I think there's quite a lot of myths that we want to try and um, bust out there. Um, we've also of course got our resident uh, SITR expert, my um, on dial phone friend, it's at the phone today because he's here in the room, so uh, Neil Pearson from Milton Reeve. Um, he's going to be um, uh, talking after the three presenters and keeping us on track in terms of um, what other help and resources that there might be out there, things that we need to consider, um, points around the tax law and um, other things around financial promotion, things that we need to consider and think about. Um, the other thing that I want you to do is as we go along, we give, have use of the chat facility. So if a question comes up, please type it into your chat box and then when we get to the end of presentations, we're going to have some time for questions and answers. So I'll be reading from the chat facility, pose those questions to our experts, um, and then hopefully we can get you some feedback either on the things that you want to ask from the panel today. The other reason that we do that is because any of the responses um, and questions that we get that we think are useful, we will share back out through our SITR knowledge bank so that um, if other social entrepreneurs and charities I'm happy with questions and have the same questions they can get the answers to too. So um, that's the background. Um, hopefully, um, is everybody okay? Can I just check in with the sound quality? Is everybody okay with the sound quality and for all those that are dialed in that unmute? Anybody want to unmute if they're concerned? Just check that people can hear us, Chris. Can. Checking in data, the data's not giving me signals, so I'm hoping that the sound quality is okay. Yep, got thumbs up. So we'll carry on um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. Are we okay with the yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to get to see his questions come up. Okay, right, so let's start over and we're going to go back and introduce Grace. Cool. Um, is this working? So I should put this next to Yeah, it's not working. 
Grace yeah. slides there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry. One second. Smile. We have some slides to share with you um, for um, each of the presenters. So we're sharing screens and you should be able to see these, but we'll also make sure that um, after uh, the webinar, all of these are available with the audio. Okay, so there we go. Thank you very much. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, I'm Grace England. I'm an investment manager at a company called Resonance. Um, and today I'm going to have to share a bit about SMPR funds. Um, but very briefly, first of all, can I share my name? Um, very quick intro. So Resonance um, is basically a social investment company. So everything we do is about trying to help social enterprises raise the investment that they need to grow their social impact. And the key thing to know is that we do that in two um, key ways. So firstly, we are a consultant to social enterprises, so we work one-to-one -one with them to help them uh, with the, getting investment ready um, and can help them raise investment directly to so find investors that really share their social mission. Um, but the second way we do all this is through creating and managing our own social investment funds. Um, so we've got eight different social investment funds on the management at the moment. Um, so I won't go into all the details of those because the important thing today is that two of the funds that we have created and manage our social investment tax relief funds, SLTR funds. Um, so I'm going to have to share, share a bit about uh, the pros and cons of that approach to SLTR. Um, just before you go on, yes. um, uh, Grace, I, I saw a message there from Ted to say that uh, I just want to check that everything's okay, that you can still hear us. I would have to come out and share. You have to come out and share the screen. Yeah. I don't know whether Ted, you can unmute and just. <laughs> Let us know if there is a, a sort of raised hand flag. I don't want to be carrying on with uh, this in particular. Slideshow. It comes in the slideshow. I'm just wondering if that's a, is that, okay. Slides aren't showing as in presentation mode. Okay, so. Um, Give me one moment. Okay. Do you want to carry on talking, Grace? And yeah. uh, uh, Chris will see if you can fix that issue. Thank you for letting us know. There you go, Ted. Okay, so this map basically shows up, uh, this slide, sorry, just shows a map of the UK because um, residences, SRTR funds are essentially all uh, focused on a specific geography and their key aim is to tackle poverty and disadvantage in that specific area. So, so far we've got two SOTR funds, one focused in Bristol and the surrounding area, and one focused in the West Midlands. But our overall plan is to launch SOTR funds right across the UK, all focused on very specific uh, local areas. Um, and that's really because we found that to be the most effective way of investing for impact, and um, bringing together lots of investors uh, in one place to, I guess, try and tackle uh, local social, social issues in a more focused way. Um, are the slides now visible? So I can refer to them? Yeah, okay, great. Um, so I'm going to have to share, as I said, the pros and cons of going um, looking at SLTR through a fund structure. So I thought I'd start with why did residents think about uh, setting up SLTR funds and then I'll look at the pros and cons from an enterprise's perspective. Um, so from my perspective as a fund manager, um, I guess setting up SLTR funds were a bit, was a bit of a no-brainer really. Um, I think we all agree here on, on the benefits of SLTR for social enterprises, um, particularly in helping them raise uh, investment much more affordably than they'd be able to do um, without the tax relief and be able to access much more flexible terms. So we essentially, wait as launch, we wanted to make SLTR much more accessible uh, for social enterprises on a much bigger scale and also trying to engage as many investors uh, in using SLTR as possible. So a uh, fund structure is just a very easy way to do that on mass, basically. A way to pull together lots of investors at any one time and to invest in lots of different social enterprises at the same time as well, rather than having to try and match each and every one of them up individually. So it was as simple as that really, and that's why um, we've kind of taken this route in getting SLTR in traction. Um, 
But from your perspective, from a social enterprise perspective, why should you uh, bother thinking about SLTR funds? So I've outlined here some key benefits that I see uh, when using SLTR funds. Uh, they fit into four key areas. Um, firstly, is around time and resource. So with an SLTR fund, we have, as the fund managers, basically um, already secured all the investors. So there's a pot of money ready to go, waiting to be invested. So you as a social enterprise don't have to do any pitching or marketing, you don't have to find the investors, you don't even have to know who they are, and you don't have to negotiate terms, um, which we've found to make the process much quicker and more straightforward because we obviously have a standard process to look at investments um, and you don't get as much as a potential, um, potential investors changing their mind or changing the goalposts, it's all kind of quite a standard uh, offer really. Um, other key kind of time saving thing there is that there's one point of contact. So, with the West Midlands Fund, uh, I manage that fund, so literally I'm the person you speak to, just one person. Um, whereas, uh, if you were to go it alone, there would be uh, at least a handful of investors to manage, if not many more, um, in terms of marketing or answering queries, or particularly after the investment's been made, obviously um, they want to know what's going on, so you have a lot of different people to deal with in that stage as well. Um, and yeah, I guess one of the key things really is this field of investor um, relations and investor queries. So we get a lot of queries from investors asking details of what's going on, and when they see things in the news about certain social enterprise, they want updates. So all that just comes to us as a fund manager, and you as an enterprise don't have to deal with any of that communication basically. Um, secondly, I have flagged the experience support as a real advantage of the SLTR funds. Um, they're obviously led by a fund investment team, so it's our job to work directly with the social enterprises to help them understand what the investment's all about and work out if it's right for them. And um, also throughout the process give constructive feedback so it's definitely not a process where you just come and get a yes or no response. Um, we, I guess I can only speak from residents' perspective, but our approach is definitely to input quite a bit into helping you get things in order and in a position that it's ready to actually consider investing in. And there's various resources we can help you draw on to get to that point. Um, we can also take care of the SOTR eligibility application, so um, the advanced assurance process, which uh, I'm sure we'll go into later. Um, that's kind of our responsibility as the fund manager to check that we've got that assurance and that and we believe that you're eligible for SOTR, so you don't have to worry about that either. Um, and also the ongoing monitoring support. We, um, as a team, will continue a relationship with you throughout the whole loan. So if there are any issues that come up or potential obstacles that you're facing, we're kind of always there to try and help when we can. So um, it's definitely a long-term relationship that we like to build with uh, social enterprises. Um, thirdly, around planning. Oh, I think this is a really crucial one, that, um, because it's a ready-made pot of SLTR funds that already exists, and there's a standard process um, that you can work along, I think it's much easier for you to plan towards, so you can kind of look a year ahead even and say, you know, we need investment around this time, and you can start the process wherever works for you, really. Um, which I think some social enterprises have found really useful, that they always know where they are in the process. They can plan um, team capacity around certain uh, milestones in the uh, due diligence process. So I guess it's a bit less, um, there's less risk of wasting time on kind of uh, unnecessary bits of the process, or there's less risk of wasting time um, when the investors suddenly turn around saying they've changed their mind because we are going through a kind of step by step process that you can kind of opt out of at any time. Um, and there's also standard terms as well. So we offer a standard um, type of loan, standard costs, and standard length of time. So again, if you want to plan ahead, even a few years in advance, you kind of know what you're going to be offered uh, ahead of time, really. Um, and then finally, connections. So again, I can only speak from residents' point of view, but with our funds, because they're geography focused, we um, put a lot of time into building a business support network alongside our funds, so that you're not just getting investment, but you can get um, investment of time and skills from local people as well to help bolster your business and hopefully develop mentors or 
local resources that could help you along the journey. Um, and also connections to other enterprises that we might be invested in or other networks that we're working with locally. And um, so yeah, I hope it's a very kind of holistic approach to um, taking social investment because there's lots of avenues that we can kind of bring in to support you. Um, so that's the pros. The cons, um, I've got fewer of, but I guess you could say I'm biased. Um, but to, just to summarise, there are genuinely I guess downside of going through this approach. So, um, some might have found that SRTR funds might be less flexible for them. Oh, sorry, I forgot to change this slide. <laughs> um, so, yeah, some people might find SRTR funds not to be as flexible as going it alone because obviously, as I said in the pros, it's a kind of standard offering. This is the type of loan we offer, and then it's over this many years. Whereas, if you go it alone, I guess you could create your own terms. And sometimes that can mean that you'll end up with a low interest rate, particularly if you can get an SLTR loan from supporters. Um, so there's definitely cases out there where there's local people that really want you to do well and they've been supporters for years and in some cases don't even require an interest rate, which is obviously brilliant to say if you've got that. Um, and the added benefit of that is obviously you've still got that direct relationship with your investors as well. Um, which is a downside of SLTR funds. Whilst you've only got one point of contact, which saves lots of time, you might miss having that direct for kind a of long term relationship with uh, investors directly. Um, the final two I've put up as cons, but for me they're perceived cons, and I don't think in the end they are um, downsides. Um, first of all, some people think the reporting requirements of a fund will be too much of a headache, so don't want to bother with it. Um, and there definitely are reporting requirements that we would have. Um, so we uh, take information from you quarterly, so quarterly management accounts, and also uh, track your social impact alongside you to see how uh, you're doing as delivering your social mission. Um, so some people might initially think, oh, you know, I can't bother with all of that. I'd rather just be the, in charge of my own reporting destiny. Um, but I do think in the long run, this is all designed to be much more of a help than a hindrance. And lots of enterprises we work with have found this to be a really valuable part of the process because I guess it helps them get into the discipline of reporting internally and actually checking in on themselves, are they actually doing what they set out to achieve? And if not, there is somebody, i.e. us as the fund management team, to check in with and see if there's anything we can do to help. Um, and then finally, um, there is a due diligence process, which I guess you do get with any investor, um, so it's not that we're unique. But sometimes people have the preconception that you know working with a kind of formal fund might be a more difficult due diligence process than maybe working with a group of local investors that they already know. Um, and I guess it is true that we we couldn't just you know as much as we loved an enterprise if, for example, you'd had very poor governance, we couldn't just you know overlook that and say, well, we love what you do, so that doesn't matter. So it might mean we'd have to encourage you to you know sort out your governance. Whereas maybe um, if you've got a local group of supporters that already want to support you, they might be able to overlook a few holes and take more of a gamble than we could. Um, but again, in the long run, we obviously hope that this is much more helpful because we're hopefully helping you uh, fill in holes that could become more of an issue in the long run if you don't sort them out now. Um, so there are my initial thoughts and comments. So overall, to summarise my thoughts, I would think if you're looking to use SMTR, then fund, the fund group is particularly helpful if you don't have this ready-made group of supporters that are ready to invest straight away, um, because otherwise it will take masses of time to find them and negotiate with them and coordinate them. Um, so particularly if you're on time on resource, um, particularly if you've got time restriction where you need to invest by a certain date, then obviously funds make that all sense because it's a ready-made pot of money to approach. Um, if you prefer that one point of investor contact to kind of reduce the headaches um, and don't mind losing that direct conversation with investors, albeit obviously you've still got a conversation with the fund uh, and the team that aren't part of as your investor, you won't obviously know every single individual person underlying that. Um, and also if you want some more support as well, so I've put there about regulatory concerns. If you're not sure about that, you don't really have time to look into it. Or if you want to support the other bits of bringing your investment proposal together, then it can um, be useful to work with the fund team. 
Um, so very broadly, uh, this doesn't seem to be moving ahead. Uh, I don't think it added my latest thing. Anyway, I, I'm going to do the case to do because I want to share a real example of something we invested in. Um, I don't know if I have time to do that or should I cover that at the end? Yeah, perhaps we'll come back to that as, yeah. a, as a case study because um, I think there's a couple of things that you, um, you've talked about there. One of the things that I'm keen for all of the speakers to do is to talk about something practically in terms of um, what the money was um, used for. Um, but I'll come back and I'll ask you a question about that. Yeah, okay, that's great. Fine. I'm conscious of time. So um, thank you very much. That was um, how you get um, uh, money from a fund manager and outlining quite clearly the pros and the cons. Um, I'm gonna come back and I'm also gonna ask you some questions based around, um, you know, you talked about investors. So, you know, typically how many investors do you have in a fund? And then typically how many investors invest into each one of those particular investments with an individual organization? So that we can try to get some compare and contrast maybe between the different ways. Um, but for now, we're going to perhaps um, switch and, and some of the things that Grace talked about, about um, raising money through some quarters. Um, I'm going to pass over to Dave um, Boyle from the Community Shares Company, and he's going to talk to you um, particularly about raising money through community shares and uh, crowdfunding. So, where we're looking at mass investment. Cool. Thank you very much, Mel, and welcome, everybody. Um, if you can't see um, my screen, which should be headed. Uh, with uh, with the text saying key features, then holler, wave, and shout, or stamp your feet, whatever it takes. Uh, but I'm going to work on the assumption that you can see that, and I'll scroll through it as I work through it. Uh, can I just check as well that the audio is Ted saying that the audio is not good, but um, everybody else thought the audio was okay. So are we still okay with the audio? Okay, perhaps you'll. Um, you'll let us know if there's any other audio issues. I just encourage the speakers to make sure that you're close to the mic. You're coming through um, loud and clear. Yes, it's better, thanks Ted. Okay, it's certainly fine for us today, so if you want to carry on. Okay, thanks very much. <clears throat> so, um, community shares and more broadly sort of crowdfunded uh, investment for which realistically is either uh, community shares or, or um, uh, crowdfunded debt, uh, like a bond issue, um, whilst many of the principles remain the same because you're basically trying to raise funds from people who you're doing most of the work to find. Um, so unlike the SRTI fund where essentially they'll find you the investors um, or the investors have already invested uh, in the fund, um, with the crowdfunding sort of solution, it's somewhere between um, and much more sort of, you know, if there was a spectrum between the three presentations or the three sections of this webinar, you've got the SITR funds over here and you've got the do-it-yourself approach. The crowdfunding is much more towards the do-it-yourself end. Some platforms, especially for debt or for things like uh, proper crowdfunded equity um, and things like Cedars or uh, Crowdcube, might have more of that element of providing you access to investors because they have regular um, or means to connect with investors who might use the platform and might be interested in, in your type of uh, investment offer. Um, but in the main, most of the platforms tend to make it axiomatic that you they're providing you the facility to take your, your investment opportunity to a wider audience and you have to do the donkey work. So... You know, that's something which sits behind all of this. That, that I think there is a view amongst certainly people who've not really spent much time in the field that, that crowdfunding by virtue of being a new term um, and it relates to something on the internet, that it's, that it's somehow a form of uh, pixie dust. You can sprinkle over a project and you can press a button and your web page goes live and you sit back and watch the money roll in. Um, that happens about one in a million um, because it's so funky that, uh, that it catches viral fire. In the main, though, behind every successful community share issue or community bond issue, um, there are a bunch of people doing a heck of a lot of work to engage with potential investors or more particularly to, to take the people who are already in their community of interest and sort of uh, uh, deepen that engagement to make them investors. So 
So they they, they generally are working on people who are already in contact with them, um, as opposed to finding people who are brand new and have never heard of of the organisation or the project before. So. Focusing on community shares, I'm not going to bore you with some of the more technical aspects of what community shares are, but I'll try and give you the headlines, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of opportunity for those of you who have specific questions, and because some of these questions might be more boring than life itself, uh, then feel free to raise them with me offline outside of the chat function. Um, but the key features are essentially that with a community share issue in a, in a, in a society which would if we're talking about SITR, it has to be an asset locked community benefit society or a charitable community benefit society. The share capital is based on one member, one vote, regardless of the amount of share capital invested. So um, with normal equity, the more you have invested, the greater the proportion of the company's equity you control. And usually that's commensurate with a certain uh, similar proportion of voting rights at the AGM and influence over the formation of the board of directors. With a community benefit society, it's uh, expected to be a one member, one vote system. So if I put in £100,000, which is the legal maximum, I get the same vote as somebody who puts in £150. And immediately, if you, if you can't see why anybody might do that, then community shares might not be for you. Um, because there is a sort of uh, there, there is a sort of different uh, vision behind the community benefit society about everybody being equal in their commitment to the organisation achieving its goals and delivering the community benefits. The things in which we differ, i.e., our ability to make an investment into an organisation, are not relevant to how much power we should have in that organization and obviously that's a very different conception of influence and control which you would find in a in a more standard company and um, it's not to say that one is better than the other it's that they're perhaps better suited to different types of enterprise um, in particular community benefit societies have shown themselves to be um, very popular to organisations who are looking to own assets collectively on behalf of a community, um, where the idea that that somebody who somebody might own, you know, all of us in the community are equal, but some people are more equal than others, isn't a good fit with the idea that everybody in the community should have the ability to enjoy an asset, be it a pub, for it always must be a pub in a community shares talk. Um, or a, a peer or some other asset like that. So that tends, you know, if that's some, the sort of thing which makes you run for the hills, then, you know, maybe that's, that's because you need to maybe think about other, other legal vehicles and other types of, uh, of equity or debt investment. On a similar, t on a similar sort of uh, uh, point, um, the shares are not transferable and there's no capital gain possible. Um, you know, if you were running for the hills on the last point, then you'll be, um, you'll be, you'll have picked up the pace at this particular juncture. Um, the value of the shares cannot rise in terms of their stated capital value. You can have interest paid on your capital stock. Um, think of it more like the way a bank account increases in value because you get your annual interest payment. Um, but it's not that the actual money is worth more through some kind of capital gain or revaluation of the enterprise. Um, the shares are not transferable. So once you invest, you the only way in which you can uh, extract your funds is through the society enabling what's called withdrawal, which is, you know, the nearest analogy, analogy to that is, is a redeemable share. Um, in, or, or it's bought back by the company, the, the society, I should say. So um, that's how you would get your money back. And to that extent, the business needs to be trading successfully to the extent that it can afford to enable you to take your money out. Um, if, uh, if you have normal share capital, then to some extent, my ability to realize the value of my initial investment is a function of how much I'm able to persuade somebody else that my investment is a good one and therefore if they invested it too would be a good one um, that might or might not have any real bearing on the inherent value of that particular investment in that company um, whereas with a community benefit society there's no possibility of what you might call speculative value um, 
interest sort of this is one of the big points that the the, the equity in societies and debt in societies as well i should say as well is exempt from regulation under the financial services and markets act 2000 and um the associated regulatory framework governing public offerings of shares there is a whole set of regulatory um compliance required of anybody who's trying to raise more than about a hundred thousand pounds and going to the general public and saying i've got this great business idea i'd like some investment would you like to invest in it please and you know if you if you're not in control of who might hear that message if it is being broadcast to all and sundry then it has to be regulated and it has to be signed off and that can be a quite involved and certainly very expensive process whereas with societies um, the equity is exempt from those regulations. And so the only real legal framework governing the issue of the shares is firstly the 2014 Community and Co Cooperative and Community Benefit Societies Act, and secondly, the law of contract and, and misrepresentation. So you have to give a fair position of, of the business's prospects and its current standing. Um, and if you do that, then it's, a quite, then it's essentially a, a, a case of buyer beware. Um, that makes it a much more affordable mechanism for often smaller scale startup businesses or organizations who realistically can't call upon um, the amount of money they might need to get uh, their share off for documentation regulate or approved by a regulated person, which can be anything from between 15 and 25,000 pounds upwards. Um, it's very difficult to get an exact market going rate, but um, I've never heard it quoted for less than that. Interest can be paid on your share capital um, at a level sufficient to attract the investment. Uh, that's a particular phrase used by the FCA who regulates societies to ensure that societies are able to essentially pay the costs of capital and reward their investors, but it can't be a mechanism to distribute surpluses or, or something which takes money away from the community benefit um, implementing sort of aspect of the enterprise so if you're paying lots of interest and not doing much community benefit that's illegal if you're paying some interest and doing lots of community benefit then you know that's exactly what you should be doing um, the interest can be committed in advance or it could be contingent on the business actually having that level of uh, uh, surpluses to justify those kinds of returns the same is true of withdrawal um, because it's equity, the, the, the right of return has to be contingent on the board of the society having taken the view that all things considered, it represents a, an acceptable and prudent use of the society's money to enable, say, 10% of the shareholders to, to have their shares bought back by it. Um, and the board have the, the rights to say, actually, it's not prudent for any equity to be repaid or maybe a smaller amount maybe three or four percent so um that's that's part of the operating environment of community shares and it does it does favor patient capital from people who want you to succeed so if your um if your enterprise is the kind of business where the people who might invest in it are going to be the recipients of the benefit from the activity and maybe they'd like to have a return, but if they can't get as much of a return as, as you hoped, they're still relatively happy because they're living in a world where their village has a pub or they're living in a world where their community has a centre which is open to the public for all sorts of activities to take place. And because they live in that community, they're happy to, to pay that price. Um, so it's very well suited where you have a very strong alignment between the kind of people who are going to be the users and beneficiaries of your activity and you want to get your capital from those people because you'd rather have the capital from the people closest to your activities rather than, for want of a better way of putting it, distant shareholders or distant investors who didn't really understand what you were all about and, and weren't really as invested in your successes as perhaps local people or people who are directly um, inscribed in your success might be. Dave, I'm quite conscious of time, so we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, do you want yeah. to move the slide up a bit for us?
Sorry. Yeah, yeah, so thanks, thanks Mel. Um, so what you basically need to do this, you need a project retiring capital and ideally projected rates of return. If you're looking to, to fill your leaky bucket of grant money, which is drying up, then this isn't for you. You need to have a project where you can say, with this money, we will make some change to our business model and that will increase uh, the, the, the ability of the business to generate the revenues. And at the end of this investment sort of phase, we will be in a more sustainable place with greater revenues and greater choices, including the ability to service that capital with interest rates. You need a crowd of people who strongly identify with your project. This is the critical one. And it's the sort of, you know, it, is it for you? If you know that there are a crowd of people who are, you're already talking to, you're already in communication with, and you think you could convert them, then it's a great method. If, however, you're starting from a low base and you're thinking we don't really know who might invest in our share issue, then before you even get to the stage of asking people to invest, you've got to find those people in the first place and warm them up and tell them why you're great and why you need them to be investors. So there is quite a bit of work and you need to have that crowd. And finally, you need to have a willingness to share ownership and governance with that crowd because those people will become your owners on a one member, one vote basis and they will have the right to essentially sack you or the right to replace you on the board of directors. And that's not for everybody. And it needs to be borne in mind that it does come with this territory. You obviously need the right legal structure, which I've mentioned a community benefit society with a statutory asset lock or an exempt charity status from HMRC. And finally, you need a group. This can't be done by one or two people who are committed to it. You need to have almost gone through the first phase of convincing the first ring of people to back this project to the extent that they've prepared to donate their time or join in and help you make it happen and help you promote it. Because if there's two of you and then you're trying to go to a thousand people, um, there's an element of have, have you actually tested the idea with maybe 10 people and did any of them think it was such a good idea they wanted to roll their sleeves up and help, it ha help you make it happen. And if you have been asking those people and they've not come and helped you make it happen, then maybe that's a signal from your market that, that there's, there's something wrong with the way you're, you're, you're phrasing it. So I'll give you a quick example of one particular issue, which was Comedia Bath. It's a, 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 a music and arts and comedy venue in Bath. It was privately owned, and the owners were looking to transition towards community ownership to make Bath um, realise what it had and to grow the engagement with the the people in Bath who liked the venue or and liked the arts and culture and music and comedy and liked to live in a city where there was this venue which could give them these interesting and exciting acts who otherwise they'd have to go to Bristol or go to London to see. Um, and they can, they're, they're in the process of converting their existing company into a community benefit society. They got SITR um, uh, advanced, advanced assurance and they held their share offer on crowdfunder and they had a video they had a lovely share offer document they had all these comedians uh, as you can see there the ubiquitous Catherine Ryan and they raised 380,000 pounds from 304 investors in 68 days um, a big you know that could have been much quicker but at the time HMRC were having one of their uh, periodic uh, times where it was taking the best part of three months to give advance assurance and that held things up um, and they're paying three percent interest withdrawable after three years uh, contingent on new capital being introduced so they're going to move to an open share offer far too technical I'll you know we can cover that off privately um, the core external costs so there were a lot of costs they they internally had to budget to drive the campaign to drive the marketing and the share offer um, which were cut, which you know there was a cost to it, but they were able to cover that because these people were already employed. Um, but the actual external costs, which were which they needed to pay, were essentially the platform costs from running it on crowdfunder, which because they were VAT registered, were in the region of six point five percent. So of that three hundred eighty thousand, they'll pay about six point five for for having had that mechanism operating. Um, and what support is there? Finally, you've got several options. I'll quickly run through them. You've got the Hive, which is a funded program by the Cooperative Bank, which can provide four days of support to help you get a share issue to the starting line, cost you 100 quid, 
and you get four days of support from a, wrist, uh, a roster of uh, approved providers, one of which is my good self. Um, you've got the Power to Change Booster Fund development grant. So Power to Change Booster Fund is a, 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 an organize, a Power to Change or a grant funding organization to focus on community businesses with a local focus. And they're, they're able to invest in share offers alongside um, your supporters, but they can also give you up to £10,000 of a development grant to help develop your share issue and again get it to the starting line. If you're a pub, um, you could apply to the more than a pub fund, which can provide consultancy support and up to 2.5k in uh, grant bursary to cover some of those startup costs, legal registration, getting a valuation of the pub. Uh, the REACH Fund, which is something maybe other people might mention as well, um, can provide up to £15,000 to organisations to get what's called investment ready, um, which could incur, which could en encompass all sorts of the process from doing a share issue, from legally incorporating, producing your documentation, producing a video, all the marketing around that, building your business case and your business plan and your financial projections, yada, yada, yada. All of that can be covered under the REACH Fund. And finally, um, you've got the Crowdfunder Power to Change Starter Fund, which is essentially, um, let's say you've got an idea for that you think your community business, which again, it, because Power to Change are involved, it has to be community businesses. Your, your community business would like to do a share issue, but you don't know if you're going to be successful or not. So test the water. Try and do some basic crowdfunding first. Get that matched by Power to Change. If you've successfully raised up to £6,000 and had it matched, happy days, you can build a kick-ass share offer. If you can't raise £6,000, then it was probably a great idea to find that out before you try to raise a quarter of a million. Uh, because if you can't do six, you sure as heck can't do the quarter of a million. Um, so there's quite a lot of support for community share issues. Um, and uh, it, there are links available to all of those you can find quite easily on, on that there, Google. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much, Dave. Always a challenge to get all these passionate people within the time scale. So I'm going to hand over very swiftly um, to Russ um, and uh, he'll talk through. And um, we'll just change to your slides as well. So we've gone from talking about um, funds and knowing your investors to crowdfunding. Definitely my takeaway from today is crowdfunding is not some uh, equivalent of social investment pixie dust. I love that one, Dave. I shall remember that one forever. So um, we're going to um, now move across to uh, Russ Bubbly for Life for Change. And this is talking about getting investment from individuals. And I know Russ has got some experience having raised SITR with a number of different organisations. Chris, can you just press the W button and the X and the X? W and F, yeah? Yeah. Is it control W or? No, never mind. Let's, uh, I think it's probably because it's in. It's in the. Mm. Let me give you one second. Okay, whilst, whilst yeah, Chris is doing that, let me, let me start off with a, with a little, little story, mm. actually. Um, Near me, there's this lovely little park. Uh, it's particularly good this time of year. Sun is shining. It has had a great friends group as well, and they've been organising many years now. It's got things like volunteer litter picks, getting local artists to exhibit in the park cafe, arranging for concerts to be put on in the bandstand in the summer. Then, a few years ago, the council came to them and invited them to start taking over the cafe. And they said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Um, we're going to, uh, you know, reincorporate as a, as a, as a CIO, a charitable incorporated organization, um, and start running it as a social enterprise. And, and it's been going quite well. They're making a small surplus. Now, time moves on, and just outside the cafe, there's this little sort of splash pool, paddling pool thing. And it's in getting a bit decrepit, really, as, as a lot of park facilities are now in the face of austerity. Um, and they have a quote to do it up, £400,000. Well, you know, these things do cost. The council has said they'll put in 200000 And someone had been talking to the friends group about SITR. They said, aha, we can raise the other £200,000 with a loan. And so they asked their accountants to put together a model, and sure enough, that says 
that they should just about be able to use their surplus to pay back the loan. Great. Great. Committee got together. And I should say, this is a committee really of, of volunteers, well-meaning individuals. So it would come as no surprise for a part of Friends group. I thought, okay, we have made tons of grant applications over the years. We know the form. You've put down what's great about the place. You, you sort of perhaps over-egg it slightly because that's what grant funders look for. We can do that with a loan. We've got a model so it's going to work. We've got a park we can put up notices in saying we're looking for loan money. We've got a wall in the cafe. That's great. Now, I mean, so there was that thing that the council, there have been rumours that the council were going to start looking for, to charge business rates, even to charities. And yeah, that might not have been a hold of a financial model. And there was that thing that the accountant was another volunteer and is actually a specialist in corporation tax and not be producing financial models. She thinks the model's fine. Hmm. We can paper over these things. Just think how nice that part be with all the kids splashing around in the park. They're going to go ahead and try to do it themselves and raise money under an SITR loan. Kind of dodgy. And this is why we start getting into the area of all the reasons that you might want support. You might need regulation there, disclaimers and all that sort of thing. So, let me just briefly introduce, I work for Eye for Change, it's a consultancy that focuses on social investments. We work with charities and social enterprises, uh, we're looking to raise money uh, from social investment, and we work with charitable trusts who sometimes invest in this type of stuff as well. We've been advising ISITR for a long while now, uh, including, on, I think it was number four of the, uh, the SITR deals that got done. Uh, some of the advice we give is regulated financial advice. You'll get very used to disclaimers if you're doing DIY investments, if you're doing DIY investment raise. I had to think for a moment, you know, is sitting here today and telling you about this stuff a financial promotion? If I cross the line from providing you information to actually pitching to get your business, then it's a financial promotion. So I'm going to be very careful not to do that. The regulatory issues, and I know Dave touched on them, um, I'm going to just talk about them very briefly. The most important thing is that in your dealings with people, you need to be true, clear, fair, and not misleading. And I would hope that any charity or social enterprise that's looking to raise money would be doing those things anyway. There are other technical considerations as well. There are restrictions from the company tax. There are restrictions from the financial promotions order. In some cases, there may be a requirement for someone to check that the investment is suitable for the person making it or appropriate for them. And that's a nice technical distinction between suitable and appropriate as well. And for some of you, in some fundraisers, there may be a requirement to check money laundering. And I'm, I'm sure that you know, many of you will have read the money laundering, terrorist financing and transfer of funds information on payer regulations of 2017 as light bedtime reading. Don't scare everybody. Go on. No, no, no. I, I actually, if, if you suffer from insomnia, I would thoroughly recommend it as bedtime. Okay, right. Uh, <laughs> um, in terms of scaring people, there is... There is a, a degree to which you should be, if not scared, take it seriously. If you get it wrong, if you get someone to make an investment as a result of misleading statements, there's up to seven years imprisonment and or a fine. And this isn't just knowingly making a false or misleading statement. This is recklessly making a false or misleading statement or not telling people about things that they ought to be told about. And you can be prosecuted as an individual, as an organisation, or your directors, if they connived, and anyone else who you've got involved, 
who makes the money from it. So if you employ an advisor, they will want to make pretty damn sure that you're not getting it wrong because they, like you, will be legally on hook. So why with all that would you want to DIY? Why do it yourself? Well, the two reasons are really power and control. You've heard about the various strictures both from community shares, where you have to give up control in terms of your uh, you know, one member, one vote, and they can fire the directors, and all of those things that come with issuing shares. You've heard from Grace in terms of funds that it's a standardized offer. It's a full service offer, but it's standard. And this may or may not suit you. You might want something more bespoke. You might think, well, actually, uh, I want to have a little bit of flexibility in when I pay back or how much I pay back. And maybe, maybe I want something that's a bit funky that, you know, I, I pay something that's related to how well I'm doing. It de-risks the social enterprise for me. Then the other thing is the type of investors. At the, end, at the uh, community shares end, it tends to be a local community who invest in the share offer. At the fund end, you are more remote and they tend to be a certain sort of person who invests in the fund, in particular a sort of person with, well, money. Or a lot of it because most of the funds have a minimum investment size in the tens of thousands of pounds. So all of these are reasons that you might want to do it yourself. Um, you may also have access to certain key skills within your organisation. You may know something about the law, you may know something about accounts, you may be able to produce your own financial model, you might have a designer on board, all sorts of things. And the DIY route allows you to take a bespoke approach. So what do you need? Actually, very, very little. You need two things. You need a legal instrument, the investment, whether that be a share, or a loan, or a bond, or whatever it may be, and you need investors. You don't need anything else. You need to make sure you stay on the right side of the law, of course. But there's lots of things you might want. You might want a business plan. You might want a financial model. You might want some help deciding if you want to do CITA, social investment tax relief. And then, if you do, what the right form is. Then, if you're going to go out and raise money, you, need, you may need an offer document, may not. You've got to make considerations from a regulatory perspective as to whether it is a financial promotion that you'll be making. And that's a technical exercise. You may want, and most people raising SITR money do, to get advanced assurance from HMRC. This is the piece of paper that says, if you do this and nothing changes, you're going to be eligible for it, and your investors are going to be able to claim their tax back subject to being personally eligible. It's quite hard to raise funds without that. And you need access to potential investors. And again, this depends on all sorts of things. Maybe you have a particular group of people that you know you can approach. Maybe friends and family, maybe customers, you're a social enterprise, all sorts of things. Maybe you are a bank or a community benefit society, in which case things are different again. Maybe you need to go out to the general public or want to go out to the general public. All of these things may, need, may mean that you need to either seek advice or go to a third party provider. You might need help with filling in the forms for HMRC, might on an ongoing basis want help with communicating with investors or how to calculate your interest payments or even to make them. So overall, you really want to consider what type of advice and support you want, and how much of it, and how, as opposed to how much you can do internally. Melanie asked for some examples, and we've been talking a lot about interest rates so far. I would say, just to frame it, interest rates are not the only thing to think about. You have your total cost of finance, and that is the cost both to you, you should consider, but also the cost to the investor. So some of the funds in general, as well as you paying interest, there will be some kind of 
admin fee or monitoring fee or maintenance fee that can be several percent. They'll charge fees to give you the money in the first place. Some of them will also charge the investors on, in one way or another, either an upfront fee or some kind of performance fee. And an investor who is perhaps more motivated by money will be taking those into consideration when they think whether to invest in you or not. So these are some examples of ones that I've worked on, that are very different, very different approaches. They all had, they all paid very different amounts of interest, partly because they're very different risks. If you're an organization where you've got plenty of assets, you know, maybe you own your own building, you just need some money for working capital, there's no realistic prospect that you're ever going to fail to repay a loan, you can get access to cheap finance. If, on the other hand, you're coming along with an idea and a business plan and haven't actually made a first sale, you could be a very risky proposition for an investor. And even if you are going to make this social impact, they may be looking at you and thinking, ah, how likely am I to get my money back? And as a result, the interest that you will need to pay in order to command that investment will go up. The other key thing to matter for investors in the life of social investment tax relief is they're thinking, yes, I'm getting my 30% income tax relief from my social investment tax relief investment. But over what period of time should I think about that? How quickly is this investment going to be repaid? Three years and a day or 10 years? It makes a big difference if you divide that 30% over 10 years or over three years. Looking at these examples, they, they each raise money from very different sets of people in very different ways. Shofar raised money from a community of interest. Second shot coffee went out through a network of financial advisors and raised money for people who have traditionally uh, invested in more mainstream uh, investments, EIS schemes, and things of that sort. London Rebuilding Society did a, a combination thing and went out and found some high net worth investors and raised money on a crowdfunding platform. They all paid different rates of interest. Each of them thought that the rates of interest they were paying were right. Each of them raised money in very different ways from very different people. And all of them ended up being happy with the way that they did it because they were in control. Okay. Can you summarise for us, David, because we're going to run out of time? No, no that, was, that was about where I, 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 I had got to. Fantastic. And I, Thank you very much. And we're going to make sure on the final slide we've got everybody's contact details so we can ask questions. And if you start to get ready for your questions, I'm going to whiz over to Neil. So, Neil, there's some things in there that I know I've made some notes. So, do you want to do some pick up any points or respond to some of the stuff around um, some of the stuff around the technical pieces and also around um, a couple of pieces around the regulation? Pick up the things that you you want to say first of all, and then we can we can come back to them. Okay. Yep. Yep. Since I'm not. Uh, I'm just picking up my stuff, yes. I don't have any slides. Um, Russ said if you suffer from insomnia, um, try reading the uh, anti-money laundering rates, but if you suffer from really bad insomnia, try reading the SRTR legislation. Mm -hmm. um, it's way, way too complex. Um, I think a couple of things coming out, just uh, uh, on the tax side, uh, in terms of, of the difference of support that you might get depending on using fund manager versus crowdfunding versus doing yourself. I guess, the, the, the one advantage of going through an organisation that invests on a regular basis, whether it's a crowdfunding platform that you use to exercise your, or a fund like the residence fund, is, is you're, you're likely to get lots of support with regards to the whole process of going to HMRC and asking if you're eligible. And then, if you are eligible and the investment closes, helping you fill in all those dreadful bits of paper that you have to fill in in order to allow the investors to actually get the relief. Um, and also, uh, I think organisations that have done this on a regular basis will also be able to give you some real steers early on, just based on their experience of other fundraisers and other instances where they've gone to revenue and had problems that they've had to overcome. So when you're choosing one of these three groups, bear in mind one of the criteria should be what, what is the level of support you're going to get to go through that process, because the legislation is very complex. Um, and whether you're eligible or not can turn on some very small points. Um, 
uh, I, I think um, uh, Dave mentioned uh, time it takes to get HRC yes. to tell you whether or not you're going to qualify for the tax relief if you are going to go fundraise. Um, the good news is they have streamlined their processes a bit now. And um, the last three or four applications that I submitted, I've got back within 15 working days. Um, that's all within the last two months. So that's good news. Uh, if you're presenting something that is technically quite complex, you're not quite sure if you qualify or not, then 40, uh, kind of 40 days, seven weeks, six to seven weeks is what you can expect now, which is still better than the 15 weeks that they were taking a few months ago. The downside of that is one of the ways in which they've streamlined is to not actually look at some applications, what they call speculative applications. Um, and uh, they regard as speculative any application that doesn't tell them who the investors are going to be. So what are the potential downsides of doing it yourself rather than either going via a crowdfunding platform or a fund manager is if you can't identify where the money's coming from, the revenue will just write back and say, I'm sorry, but until you can convince us this is really genuinely going to go ahead, we won't look at your application. And so you get into this kind of chicken and egg situation where you find it difficult to attract investors because you haven't got HMRC to say yes, but the investors won't commit until they know that HMRC is saying okay, uh, which is a circle that's quite difficult to break, whereas with a fund manager or a crowdfunding platform, if you go to HMRC and say, we are going to raise £200,000 and crowdfunding platform X is finding the investors or fund manager Y has given an interest and commitment to it, they will process the application. So again, if you're looking at which route you're going to go down, the three alternatives that now outlined at the start, just bear that one in mind as well. Uh, uh, it's probably worth saying that ultimately, whichever route you go down, the, the tax rules are the same, the tax treatment is the same. There's no kind of distinction at all as far as HMR can be concerned, HMRC is concerned, as to which route you go down. Um, and then I, I guess uh, just coming back on the financial promotions point, which people have talked about uh, quite rightly in some detail, because it is a very important point if you get it wrong, as, as, uh, as Russ quite rightly said. Um, um, again, um, if, if, if you're doing it yourself, you do need support. It's the one area. There is uh, some guidance on BSC's website in the SITR section uh, around the general rules on financial promotions. Again, maybe an advantage of a fund manager or a crowdfunding platform is to a large extent that problem is taken away um, because you're, you're, you're not making a promotion as such. If you're going to a fund like residents, they've dealt with all of that in the way in which they've raised money from their investors. So quite bluntly, you don't have to worry about Whereas if you do it yourself, you do, and it is a very good idea to get some support. But as I say, as a starting point, it's a very good guide on uh, the BSC website. Okay, lovely. So that, that guide is actually called the Simple Guide to Financial Promotions. Um, I know it's simple because I can understand it. Um, and I think one of the, the key things that I found from social enterprises and charities is that when we start to talk about um, you know, the fact that you need to know about financial promotions, and you start to look at those detailed guides, you do get scared because, you know, the, the pages and pages of text. The great thing about that guide is it helps you to understand um, when, um, uh, or what point do you need support, so, so that's there. And what we're going to try and do now is um, use the chat facility. I've got a couple of questions, one that's an email to us and a couple that are appearing online. So if anybody else participating has a question that you want to ask to the panel, please do type it into the chat facility so that we can see them. But I'm going to start off actually with um, the, the question that I've had from Christopher Norris, which is um, around um, uh, the different types of tax reliefs. Again, very topical. So, so we often get this, asked this question. So we've talked a lot about SITR and uh, Russ mentioned um, earlier EIS, the Enterprise Investment Scheme, and then there is also SEIS, um, and um, sometimes we get questions about gift aid and community investment tax relief as well. But one of the questions we often get asked is, um, you know, what's the difference between EIS and um, SITR, and can you use both at the same time? Now I know that we've got time to do the whole sort of remit and gambit, but you just want to outline, Neil, um, 
the, the, the fundamental differences between PIS and SITR in terms of the products it can be used with. Yep. Um, and then we can talk a bit more about some, again, some free resource that we're coming, we've got coming on this very soon through getting SITR. Sure, okay. Um, well, EIS is, is very similar to SITR. They're based on the same bits of legislation, broadly speaking. Uh, so, and um, they offer the same tax relief, broadly speaking, uh, 30% mm -hmm. tax relief being the biggest, I guess, uh, attraction for investors. EIS is available only on shares, ordinary shares, in unquoted companies of any kind. So that could include um, a community benefit society that issued share capital, or it could include a community interest company that issued shares. So, in principle, a social enterprise with a share capital can issue shares um, and raise uh, under EIS, not necessarily SITR. SITR has the uh, upper hand in the sense of you can get tax relief on loans, whereas that is not possible at all under EIS. So that's probably the key distinction. SITR is available for a very restricted type of organisation, predominantly asset uh, locked organisations that are regulated, that whose social missions in some way regulated by somebody else, whether it's the Charity Commission, the Kick Ring, etc. Um, SEIS, Seed EIS, is like the little brother or little sister of EIS. It is designed for businesses that have been trading for less than two years. Again, it's focused on the private sector, but there's no reason in principle why a trading social enterprise with a share capital can't also be eligible. Um, and the, the big attraction of Seed EIS is within those limits. Uh, the tax relief for the investor is 50%, not 30%. Um, and also, there is a, a much more attractive capital gains tax relief for investors who are lucky enough to be making capital gains elsewhere on which they pay tax. So, the, the typical thought process, if you're talking to an organisation looking to raise funding, that could qualify for all of them, is say, well, if you're issuing shares, CDIS offers the best deal for investors in terms of tax relief. Um, SITR is more flexible because it offers tax relief on both shares and debt. Uh, so EIS probably comes in third. But it is, uh, but EIS is subject to bigger caps on the amounts that can be raised. So it is conceivable that you could raise some funding in SITR and then once you reach your cap of SITR, switch to EIS uh, or vice versa. Probably not vice versa. It's also conceivable that you could do a debt raise under SITR and the share issue under EIS. But the, the way in which the limits work means you've got to be very careful about the way which you might structure that. Okay. And again, this is something that we're getting asked more and more about. So um, to add to our sort of um, uh, fleet of resources, um, we will soon be publishing a simple guide to um, tax reliefs. And it will include all those tax reliefs we talked about, um, SITR, EIS, SEIS, CITR, and also um, gift aid, and then the one that I can never remember to do with ice as uh, if, 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 yeah. Innovative. Innovative, that's the one. So um, uh, again, because we do get asked this question about, you know, can I switch? And, and uh, as, as Neil says, uh, providing you meet the criteria that comes with that particular tax relief, and it does depend on your governance structure, I mean, how much money you're raising, there is no reason that you can't combine the different tax reliefs, providing you are eligible. Them. So understanding which is the most appropriate for you to use often depends on those things um, in their entirety. So we're hoping that we'll be able to publish that within the next few weeks. Um, so do look out for that with more information. So I hope that's dealt with um, Christopher's um, question. Um, I've got a couple of questions that are on geography um, in terms of reach. So Grace, um, I know it was on your map, but just in case people um, uh, don't understand um, where um, you know, what happens for SITR funds in terms of the geography? You've got some areas you're working in and looking to work in, and then also we've got some national funds and some other geographic funds. Do you want to just very quickly touch on what you currently do and what you're looking at? And then either you can pick up on the um, the other funds that are available or I'll fill that piece in as well. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, probably where I start with the fact that there are other SOTR funds available for yes. BBC. Um, so uh, there's definitely one national fund out there, out there so no jobs to restrict at all. Um, we at Resonance very much intentionally uh, restricted our focus to specific geographies because we 
believe that's the most impactful way of going about it because we think if we can focus on a very specific defined area then we've got more chance of tackling local issues and tackling poverty there rather than trying to you know do everything at once and um, that said we are trying to develop lots of SOTR funds across the country so that they can all do that alongside each other um, so yeah that's the only reason why we've only got two so far is because we're just doing that and step by step process and I guess going where we found the demand and where we found that those funds will work. Um, the next uh, fund is not set in stone yet, but uh, the strongest area at the moment in terms of where SMTR is in demand, at least in terms of our networks, is definitely towards the northwest. So uh, definitely thinking about Greater Manchester and the surrounding areas. So um, if you want to chat or learn more about the details of specific areas that are working, then feel free to get in touch. Um, but nothing's ruled out really. We tend to think about launching a fund. Um, firstly, if there's demand from the social enterprise uh, community, that's always where we start. And then secondly, if that's then matched with at least um, anchor investor interest. So we normally need about a million pound worth of uh, in interested investors before we'll launch in any one area. So watch this space because I guess it could be anywhere next. But, Great. Yeah, Thank you. North. So if you want to um, see what's available what geography, in what geography, the best place to look for this is um, goodfinance.org.uk. You can use the profiling tool to select your piece of geography um, and then you can um, pick a particular type of product. So in this case, social investment tax relief. So um, as well as um, residents working in Bristol, the South West and uh, the Greater West Midlands currently with some other um, areas coming online and you'll be able to, to see those again, they'll appear on Good Finance as they, they, they become live. Um, you also have um, Bright Futures um, that have a national fund and also Social Investment Scotland, don't be put off by the Social Investment Scotland um, piece because their um, uh, ventures fund also um, can do national um, investment. So there are, as well as geography locked um, funds, there are also some national funds as well. Um, we've got some, I can see there's some good chat going on um, uh, about um, community pubs um, and um, some examples um, and the, probably the question that it raises um, about um, good examples and uh, does it just pick up on the tenanted model piece and probably the example that it's worth sharing is the spotted cow. So um, we, um, some of the questions that Ted's been asking is about um, examples for um, uh, uh, community pubs and yes we've got plenty of examples of those as um, Dave uh, knows only well. Um, I'm trying to think what's the other one that we had come to Leeds. Um, uh, the name is escaping me that I can't remember that was a brilliant example. It'll come to me in a minute. So um, yes we've got a number of different um, examples of this. Um, one of the things that you have to look out for with um, community pubs is the trading activity particularly um, if a source of revenue is going to be around the tenanted model. Um, so um, the problem that we have is that, um, if you like, um, giving away um, responsibility for delivering the, um, uh, the trading issue in the form of a concession or a lease, um, is not considered to be um, a, um, a, a permissible trading activity. Um, however, we do have examples like the Spotted Cow who are doing a number of different things, um, including running uh, a community cafe, bed and breakfast, um, and some heritage um, type activities as well as some other community services, where they are running the pub on a tenanted model, but the tenanted piece is just a percentage of the income. So um, again, you can find more information about what's on Neil's naughty list, not Neil's naughty list, but the list that he talks about, and what is permissible trading activity. Um, but you are allowed to do some activity that's on the naughty list up to 20%. Um, so one of the things that we need to, um, you need to try and do is to manage your income, to keep track of what your income is. I know that the spot of cow, one of the things they've done is to look at a, a flexible tenancy agreement so that they can keep that balance uh, alongside all of their different income streams as well. Dave, did you want to come in there? You, you took the word right out of my mouth, Mel. It's just, it's just that the, uh, once you've got the tax relief, if you subsequently become uh, ineligible for it at any point in the three years after the date of the investment, then the responsibility is yours, but the pain will be felt by your investors who will have to repay the 
tactual leave. So you'll have some very angry people in your community of interest who get a, a letter from HMRC asking them for money they thought they'd, they'd already, they, you know, they've spent in most cases. So um, it's incumbent upon any business to keep a really keen eye on the proportion of turnover derived from different activities if there's any activity you're engaged in which must be kept under 20 percent to meet the criteria so yeah it's just uh, it's just you know you it's it's not just something you you should do it's something you have to do and you'll have some very angry people if you don't yes because it absolutely negates the the benefit that the tax relief um, brings i'm going to bring in there's some other questions that i can see um, around um, interest rates and this comes up again um, uh, on a fairly frequent basis. So um, one of the questions that I was asked fairly early on is can you set a negative interest rate? So um, to the best of our knowledge, the answer is no, because um, you need to, this needs to be a commercial activity. Um, and if it was seen to be loss making right from the beginning, I think that's right, we, we checked that out, did we not originally? Because I think somebody actually asked us if they could sit and expect a negative interest rate. Whilst we've seen interest rates um, very low, almost neutral, um, uh, I'm certainly not aware of anything that's negative, and we wouldn't, it can't be seen as any level of tax avoidance, um, so it has to be able to stand up and be seen to, want to be able to repay the loan at the end. But you know, that in a minute. Um, but we have seen a, a wide range um, of what is seen as being commercial. I think the thing that's been um, explained really well by Grace, by Russ and by Dave is it all depends on what your investors will accept. Um, and that often depends on what relationship they have. Um, so, you know, if you're invested in your community and your community sharing, you're not thinking about taking it out for a long time, maybe that's not your major um, uh, uh, driver. If you are an investor in a fund with um, a, a different range of portfolio, you want to see some investment return. You're probably prepared to trade some of that investment return for the social return. After all, that's why you invest in the social investment tax relief fund. Um, and again, on an individual case by case basis, I'm sure that depends very much on your investors. Is there anything you wanted to add on the what the rate of interest um, I, I, I mean, in the SITR legislation, the only cap is it can't be any more than reasonable, but I've yet to meet a social enterprise that's happy to pay all at a reasonable rate. Um, um, we have no guidance from HMRC what reasonable means, but they've just enshrined in another bit of the tax code 10% as being a safe harbour. I mean, okay. if it's 10 or below, the overall return is 10 or below per annum, um, then it's regarded automatically as reasonable. Um, and just on the negative interest point, well, negative interest in the context of an investment it isn't really negative interest. Yes. What you're actually doing is agreeing to be repaid less than you paid in the first yes. place, uh, which I think raises real questions uh, uh, as to um, whether there's a tax avoidance mechanism because yes. you're claiming tax relief on more than you're actually, in the end, sort of, uh, kind of investing. Uh, yes. So I, I, I'd be very suspicious about that work. Yes. I think that's why we that, that's the that's exactly where we, we've come to um, on that yeah. on that point. Um, there was another yes, yes, just around, um, around the tax rates generally, Russ picked up on it briefly. I think it applies to all social investment, not just SNPR, yes. but just to uh, flag there are other fees involved a lot of the time. So just from a social enterprise perspective, always make sure you ask that question early in the process. Um, so again, I can only speak from residents' perspective, but when we say it's six percent per annum, that's a four percent interest rate and a two percent monitoring fee. But um, I'm always very surprised out there that lots of people will say six percent and it will be added lots and lots of fees. So just always make sure you understand what fees are involved as well as the interest rate and that applies to any type of investment because there's often some things hidden. Yes, I think I think I think that's a really good takeaway from today that within the three different routes, you know, it isn't just about the interest rate, it's about what is the cost of the support, including any fees, any uh, individual consultant support, any legal support that you might need, um, as well as what, what you're going to actually pay for having the money. And it is about that balance for all organisations between the level of time and expertise you have against um, the options that are available to you. So that's that's definitely a big takeaway. Mm -hmm. And you also should not be paying for, I actually met a social enterprise last week who had been there uh, asked to pay for um, what we call due diligence. So uh, as the fund, we 
with all of that stuff. We mentioned so we provide the support and the feedback and we go on the investors and do the SOTR eligibility, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that should come at no cost to you. You should only have to pay if you actually take the investment and have the money in your account. Uh, whereas I have met some social enterprises that have been asked to pay for that phase if they didn't go ahead with the investment. So we should not have to pay at that stage, just as well. That's, that's, um, I mean, that's a model that, work, that we see quite a lot in private sector. Yes. Where uh, all they'll ask for a partial underwriting cost to do those. Right, okay. Or at least make sure you know if you're going to be asked to pay that Absolutely. bill. Absolutely. The same very much applies in, in the DIY route. As, as Neil rightly raised, there are areas where you really ought to be seeking yes. external advice, just as, uh, as you would in many other walks of life. Um, and be aware of the commercial realities. You know, look at look, so look and understand what you're being asked to pay and shop around. Okay, so uh, that's really good because I'm going to come to you in just one second for your one top tip. So that might, that might be. It. So um, I'm just going to try and, and summarise um, uh, before we do that that one top tip. So just to to, to give you that as a as a heads up. Um, I think Grace's point is very very relevant about the fact that. Um, you know, there's lots of things we've talked about here that are around social investment tax relief, but equally apply to taking on any level of social investment or apply to any so due diligence or any tax relief. I think it is also fair to say that once you do the balance of cost and time against across all of these three methods, you also still need to consider that using social investment tax relief, even in any one of those three, might be cheaper than taking on unsecured debt within any other form of social investment because um, generally um, social investment tax relief is used to help keep the cost of investment down. So um, it's always difficult to generalise, but you know, unsecured lending in social investment space can be you know, single middle digits um, upwards, so you're talking somewhere between 12 to 18%. Um, so it still might compare favourably, depending on um, depending on it. It's very difficult to generalise because it is on a case-by-case -case basis. And I remembered, um, I could see again some of the conversation between Sue, Quinn and Dave, um, it was just that piece about um, insure, uh, uh, interest and about optional rates, not to forget the FC United of Manchester option, when um, they actually issued um, two rates of interest and allows people to select which one that they were going to choose and said, if you take the lower rate, then this is what more we can do with the money. And actually, there was a much higher proportion of investors accepted the lower rate of interest because they cared as much about um, social investment. So I think it is that balance between what the investors want to see. So just summarising, don't forget the financial promotion, Simple Guide to Financial Promotions. You can find that on the website. If you're not already signed up to the Get SITR campaign, we will be in touch to see if you wish to do so. Um, don't forget... Um, some of the things around um, uh, this being more generic um, things that happen with um, in social investment. Um, we mentioned as well um, the REACH Fund. Again, you can find more information on that on Good Finance. I'm going to tell you about a couple of things that we are coming up. We've got a few minutes left. So let's just go one top tip then. Um, Dave, do you want to go first? Yeah, I suppose the tip I'd, I'd, I'd say is that the, the best you, you, when you're doing a community share issue or direct investment, there is a threshold under which, because it's quite complicated to claim these tax reliefs, um, and PAYE is, is also very difficult to, to operationalize. Um, in reality, the kind of people who the tax relief is going to appeal to are the kind of people who are going to be big investors. And making them aware that you have these tax reliefs, and more importantly, making their accountants aware that you have these tax reliefs is really, really critical. So it's not enough just to say, hey, we've got tax relief, and just leave that as a small part of your investment offer. Make it part of what you actually take out into the financial professionals in your area. Um, seed it into the networks of accountants and advisors and say, hey, we've got tax relief for this offer and instead of people thinking oh that's good I'll, I was going to give you a thousand pounds I'll give you two thousand pounds yeah. my experience they'll tend to go from I was going to give you a thousand pounds as more like a donation now I know you're going to get tax relief I'll give you ten thousand pounds because I can make this work harder for me in my money sort of face so make sure once you've worked hard to get the relief you sell it into the people for whom it's going to make a real difference okay lovely Russ one top tip do what's right for you you've got Complete flexibility whether you, you go someone for a go to someone for a prepackaged solution or say no, I want to do the bits that I want to do. Okay, Grace. Um, I would say my 
top tip is whatever option you go for is to make sure your investor is really aligned with your values and your social mission. Um, so even with, even within the social investor space, you might find very different kind of alignment. So make sure you're assessing why your investor's in it and make sure it's aligned with you because definitely the going will get took at some point. And I think the most important thing is to have an investor that will be supportive. Um, I view and make sure that your impact stays intact basically. So yeah, make sure you're doing your due diligence on your investor. Is what I would say. Okay, lovely. Liam, one top tip? Uh, I think if you're looking to raise money under SITR, uh, it's a time consuming process. But do the tax homework early. Um, don't leave it till right towards the end of the process because if you're looking to attract investors, as we've already heard from others, um, it's more attractive if there's tax relief. So you look pretty stupid if you go out and say we can offer tax relief and then six weeks later we find out we can't. So, and you lose credibility in the eyes of your investors if you do that. So, a bit of homework really on in the process. It's not a technicality, it's a fundamental part of the process. Lovely, thank you very much. I remember the name of the community pub, it's Puzzle Hall um, Community Pub, and the, uh, the reason I particularly wanted to um, uh, flag that one, actually, um, uh, we've got some more information on this, is when they got their um, SITR advanced assurance, it really helped their um, campaign, because you can see a real um, spike, actually, in the amount of money that was raised. So there's some, some more stuff there around um, uh, community shares. Um, okay, so um, just lastly from me, um, to say that we've got a couple of other things that um, are coming up. So we have um, an event that is um, specifically for uh, social enterprises that are thinking about um, uh, raising the social impact bond and potentially using social investment tax rate. If you want to find out more about that, you can find some more details of that um, again on our web pages. That's coming up on the 19th of June. We have some more one to one um, uh, SITR um, tax um, surgeries with uh, Neil um, coming up the 1st of July, I think that is. So, if any of the organisations are thinking about um, wanting to progress this further and want to talk more individually about their um, organization. Again, you can find more information on our website about that. Um, the guide to simple guide to tax reliefs will be out very soon. And if you haven't checked out the video um, using um, Red to explain what social investment tax relief is, um, uh, please do so. Unfortunately, it does mean you'll have to listen to me again at, at least some part um, of that video. I apologize in advance. Um, I just wanted to um, thank uh, uh, the panel of experts. There's been some great questions there. Um, we'll make sure that everybody's contact details, because um, I think we, we haven't not shared the slides anymore, um, are available to everybody that's logged in. And uh, thank you very much for participating. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.